that. Does America have the moral and spiritual capability to lead the world to freedom at this moment? They read about our occupation with pleasure, our scramble for material things, our obsession with sex. They read about our crime rate, about our racial tension. Too often we give the impression that we make our national decisions not on the basis of moral principle, but on the basis of political expediency. Too often we give the impression that our military bases around the world are an effort to save our own skin and not to protect that which is morally right. When the president calls for a day of prayer, very few people pray. Very few churches are open for prayer. Yet our religious organizations feast about our membership in the church, our fine organization, our possibility of church unity, and yet we are lacking today in spiritual power. And this is what the world is looking for. We've gotten to cover some really awesome topics over the last few weeks. We started off this series, A Letter to the Church of the United States, by talking about uh, uh, the content and talking about the need for community in church. We then followed that up uh, after a crazy incident that happened when Donald Trump uh, was almost assassinated, and God had put it on my heart literally uh, days before that we really needed to talk about unity in the church and finding unity in our country. And then after that, last week, we talked about marriage. And today I want to talk about actually the theme that ties all three of these messages together, which is love. It's titled, They Will Know You By Your Love inspired by the scripture that we find here in the book of John, a setting where Jesus is sitting with his disciples as they eat a final meal together before he's arrested and taken to be crucified. And so I'd love to share these few verses of scripture with you. So if y'all would, in honor of God's word, would you stand with me and let's go to the Lord in his word today. And it says here in John chapter 13, verse 34, a new command I give you, Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Dear our Lord, our Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this day. And God, forgive us of our sins, for we know that they are many. Forgive us for our shortcomings. Forgive us for the moments that we're distracted when we're in your house. Forgive us when we've come in here today with our own hidden agendas when we've come here wanting something just only for us, not thinking about what our neighbor next to us needs. And God, I pray that we come here today not with hardened hearts. We don't come here with our minds closed. We don't come here with our ears closed, whatever you're trying to say to us today. But God, I pray that in humility and in need for you, that God, we listen. And we don't just listen as we listen to the TV or we listen to our phone. But God, I pray that there is a profound impact in someone's life today. That your spirit, as it's moving through this place, moving through the souls and hearts of every person here, that someone be inspired, that someone be encouraged, that someone be shaken today by your word. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus gives this teaching at what we call the Last Supper, and what John doesn't describe as this, but other Gospels do, in a place called the Upper Room. Now, what's really interesting to me about John's Gospel is that actually half of John's Gospel takes place in what we call this Upper Room. It takes place at the Last Supper, just a day, hours before Jesus dies, before he's arrested and sent off to die. And to me, that, given it in that context, it makes these words of Jesus just seem a little bit heavier to me. I won't go as far as to say more important. I'm not going to say one set of scripture from Jesus is more important than another. But I will say that these words that he gives after he tells his disciples, I am soon about to die. And here's a new commandment I'm going to give to you. And what is this command? Is it burial instructions? Is it about what to do with his family, his mom, who's still alive? Is it how to encourage people? Is it how to build a church? Is it about some secret treasure that lays somewhere? No. In fact, it's a very simple 
And yet its simplicity is incredibly complex. A new command I give to you, to love one another as I've loved you. And sometimes this is hard for us to understand because we hear so much about love and we hear so much about love in different ways and yet we don't understand truly the deep meaning that sits behind that word. And one thing that causes us sometimes to struggle with this word love is that the word love to us means so many different kinds of things. The word love in the English language has so many meanings, and yet they're not all the same, and they're certainly not all equal. I don't love a friend in the same way that I love my brother. I don't love, for instance, maybe my parents' pet dog, Annie, in the same way that I love my friend who was the best man at my wedding. And I certainly wouldn't go as far to say, I love my wife, Emma, in the same way that I love a spicy chicken deluxe sandwich from Chick-fil-A. I just use the same word to describe all of those things, all six of those things, same word, six different meanings. Love can mean a lot of things, but the meaning always seems to be different. Even though we use that one word for so many things, it's always different. And that's something that's actually interesting when we look to the translation of Scripture. Because if you look into the translation in the original language of Scripture, you can see they don't have this same problem that we have. But in fact, in Scripture, we actually see three different words all being translated into the English word love. And if y'all are uh, going to allow me for a moment to nerd out over the Bible for a sec, I actually want to share these three words for you. There's three words that the Bible uses in Greek, the language that Jesus spoke, the language the Gospels are written in, to describe love. And those three words are eros, which would mean romantic, like the love that you have for a boyfriend, a girlfriend, uh, your wife, your husband. There's philos, philos, which means friendship. So like I have a friend, like my friend Brian, he's I love him as a philo, I love him as a friend. And then the third word is maybe one you've heard before, and that is agape. When people were trying to define how God loves people, they realized that neither of those worked. I don't love Jesus like I love my wife, but also I realize that my relationship with Jesus is more than just a friend, that Jesus is my friend, but yet our relationship is a lot more than just friend. So then came this word, agape meaning the love of God. And this love is noted as meaning two specific words, unconditional and sacrifice. The love of God is sacrificial. God sacrifices for us. The greatest sacrifice being Jesus on, dying on the cross for our sins, taking our sin on for us so that we may be saved. That's sacrificial. And that's a theme that exists throughout all of the Old and New Testament. And also there's this theme that is so different from the love that we experience in the world. The word unconditional. Unconditional love. Because that's not the love that we experience in the world. The love that we experience in this world teaches us that love is very, very, very conditional. Friendship is conditional. Romance is conditional. Even as we talked about last week, the love that we find in marriage, the world tries to say, is conditional and temporary. And yet the love of God is the exact opposite. It's unconditional. He loves you even though you've sinned, even though you've run away from him, even though you have rejected him, even though you've rejected his word, rejected the sacrifice of his son. There's still a love for you, and there's still a want for you to go toward him and to seek salvation. And the word that is used here in John that we read about, it's really interesting because the way that Jesus tells his disciples to love one another, our immediate response is friendship. That Jesus is saying, I want you to be friends with one another. But that's not the word Jesus uses. Here in John, he doesn't use the word philo. He uses the word agape. Meaning what Jesus is commanding and teaching his disciples is not just to be friends with one another, But rather, I want you to share in love with each other the same kind of love that God is sharing with you. I'm commanding you to share in God's love with one another. 
That means to show love to one another like God shows love to us. A sacrificial love where God gave up what was most dear to him for our sake in an unconditional love that has no limits and is never ending. Romans 13.8 calls us as disciples of Christ to let no debt remain outstanding except the debt of love that we have to one another. Think about that idea of debt. You have a debt limit. If you've bought a house, took out a credit card, you know that you have a limit on your debt. The bank says you got a $5,000 limit. The bank told you or the mortgage company told you we can give you up to X amount of dollars for you to borrow to go buy a house. That is a limit on your debt. Another thing that's taught in Scripture is that you should let no debt remain outstanding. Meaning that if you have a debt to someone in the church or a debt to a bank or a debt to a mortgage lender, a mortgage lender whoever, it should be your goal to get out of debt. And then uses that illustration to then say, you should let no debt remain outstanding except the love debt that you have to one another. That's a debt that has no fulfillment period. There is no time in our relationship with each other as the body of Christ, as the church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can stop loving each other. It's an unending debt that I'm always call, going to love my brother or sister in Christ. I'm always going to love my friend, always going to love my wife, always going to love my fellow church member. It's something that is never meant to end, that God never wants to end. There is no limit. There's no exceptions. There's no expectations. That's what unconditional means. And that's the kind of love that Jesus commands us as followers to share with each other and with the world. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid that sometimes when we look to this scripture in John 13, verses 34 through 35, that we are, in a way, mistranslating it because of our messed up understanding of what love is. I worry that when we look to Jesus' command to his disciples, that we're not reading it in the context of him saying agape, sharing God's love with one another. But I'm afraid we're misreading it to mean, rather, that He's encouraging us to share in a type of philo love with each other, a friendship love with each other. And that worries me because that's an issue. Because when we step away from God's love, we're actually stepping away from what love was supposed to be. And we actually go back into what the world's definition of love is, which is conditional, which is not sacrificial. Think about what the world teaches that love is. What are the examples that you see out outside the church about how people love each other? Are you friends with someone no matter what? No. You're friends with someone as long as you like them. As long as you feel like the relationship is in your favor. People say, I love you. I love my girlfriend. I love my boyfriend. I love my husband. I love my wife. I love my best friend. As long as they give me what I want. As long as this relationship doesn't become too strenuous on me. As long as it doesn't become hard to love them. If that's a lesson that you haven't learned yet, I want to tell you today. Love is hard. Love is supposed to be hard. It's going to be hard sometimes to love your spouse. It's going to be hard to love your friends. Sometimes it'll be hard to love your children. And sometimes I wonder, was it hard for God to continue to love us when everything was going wrong? Love is hard. Love is hard because it's not conditional. Love is hard because it does require sacrifice. And unfortunately, when we as the church adopt this idea of what the world teaches love is, when we adopt the world's definition of love that we're going to love people as long as they give us something. That we're going to love one another as long as we like one another. We're going to seek love with one another as long as we're always getting along. And when we do that, what that leads to is a community in the church that is in no way sacrificial and is very, very conditional. What I mean by that is that 
When we approach love in the way the world approaches love and not the way that Jesus commands us to share in God's love, agape love with one another, it leads us into a scenario where we're not sacrificial. I don't want to sacrifice to each other. I don't want to sacrifice for my church. I don't want to be in this church no matter what. I don't want to endure hard things. I only want it to be easy. It leads to a church and a group of people that say, I'll come to church, but don't expect me to do much. I'll show up to church, but I don't really believe in giving towards a ministry. I'll show up to church as long as I like the music, as long as I like what's being preached about. And this is my church, and that means I'm only going to want people to be here who I like. I'm only going to be, want the kind of people that I define as my kind of people. And that's the exact opposite of what Jesus commanded the disciples to be like. It's the exact opposite of what he wanted his church to be. And I can't stress enough the importance of showing love in the church. I've been to churches before where I did not feel there was a sense of love. I used to, I told y'all maybe this story before, uh, when I was in college, I wasn't dating Emma, I wasn't pastoring a church, and about half the Sundays I was there, I was actually filling in at other churches preaching. So on the chance that I had a Sunday off, I di- wasn't really a part of a church. I would just go visit as many churches as I can. And I can't tell you the amount of churches I would walk into. And man, people were just, you know, sitting in their pews, not talking to each other. You'd maybe shake hands with the family close to you, but, you know, people just kind of sat there, and they would sit silently through the sermon, and as soon as they were dismissed, walk out. Sometimes not as much as a, high, as a high five, a wave, or a handshake before they left. I've been to churches before where I, as a young man, walked through the door and was able to walk all the way into service, and when it was done, I was able to walk all the way out with no one so much as asking what my name was. That's not love in the church. That's not showing love to guests. And even I would say, go as far to say that that's not showing love in some of those examples to one another in the church. Because when you're a part of a church, this is more than just a group of people that randomly meets together. This is more than people getting together for an uh, encouraging word before they start their week again. This is meant to be a family. And families mean that we should know who each other are. And there's nothing worse than being a part in a fa- of a family where you don't know anybody. And I've been to enough family reunions that are so busy and I don't know half the people there. And it's not a pleasant experience. It's not a pleasant experience to be at a party when you don't know anybody there. We should get to know each other. We should be sharing in love with one another. We should be excited when new people come in the door. We should be excited when, even more excited when they come through the second time. Meaning they may actually want to stay around for a little bit. And we should be so loving to one another, even when we're going through the hard times in life. But I can't also, I can't stress enough also the importance of not only loving each other and showing love when we're in the church, but showing love outside the church as well. Especially in this day and age. Because if you aren't aware, we are being watched. And When I mean by we are being watched, I'm not referring to the deep state. I'm not referring to Google listening to you through your iPhone like they're doing right now. I'm not referring to even God uh, watching you, even though, yes, 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 God is in fact watching you right now and is always watching you, even in private, even when you're outside of church, he is always watching. But that's not who I'm talking about right now. We're being watched by others. You're being watched by your coworkers. You're being watched by your fellow students. You're being watched by your family. You're being watched by your spouse. If you're a parent or grandparent in here, you are being watched by your kids. You are setting an example right now for who a Christ- what a Christian is supposed to be, who a Christian is. You are being watched and you are setting an example to someone in your life, even if you're not aware of it, of what it means to be a Christ follower. But how do people know that we're a Christian? How do people know that we're a Christian, that we're a follower of Jesus? Some people would say, well, it's because I attend church. That's how people know I'm a Christian. 
Maybe it's because I wear a cross necklace or I have cross earrings to let people know where I stand on my religious issues. Maybe it's because you just bought a brand new New Life Church that you can go pick up right outside those doors as soon as we get done with service. Maybe it's because you went out and you got a Jesus Fish bumper sticker that people can obviously see when you cut them off on the Lloyd. And all that points to people saying that I follow Jesus. But sometimes it puts us in a peculiar scenario. Because if we identify as Christians in that way, wearing a cross necklace, wearing a shirt, you know, people just knowing that we're involved in our church in somewhat, and then we fail to show love to them or, show, or fail to show love to someone else, what kind of example are we setting for the church that we're a part of and the God that we say that we follow? Let's go back to a moment to the scripture, to John chapter 13, verse 35, when Jesus says, by this... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The cross necklace isn't your ID. The church shirt that you wear isn't a part of your ID. It's not even the Jesus fish bumper sticker that you have on the back of your car. Love is your ID. Love is our ID. That's how people know that we're followers of Jesus. And if we fail to show love but show everything else, we're not setting a good example for who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Instead, we're pointing people away. We're pointing broken people away from the very place that they need to go, which is toward Jesus. And I know that we're imperfect. I know that the church is not full of perfect people. It's full of imperfect people who are seeking Jesus because we're imperfect. But Jesus didn't say that they will know you because you are perfect. He says they will know you because of your love. They will know you because of your agape love, your love that is willing to sacrifice, your love that is unconditional love. And when we fail to show love, we are failing to share God's love. Let me ask you a question today. It's a very simple question. If people saw nothing else, if they didn't see you here in this room today, if they didn't see your new life shirt, if they didn't see your cross necklace, your cross earrings, if they didn't see your bumper sticker, if they didn't see all of that stuff, if they only based their opinion on your love, would they think that you're a follower of Jesus? If all they could see If the only thing they could see is how you talk to your wife and your children in public and behind closed doors, would they think that you're a follower of Jesus? If they only saw how you talked to your friends and how you treated your friends, would they think that you're a follower of Jesus? If they saw how you treated and worked with your co-workers and how you spoke to your co-workers and how how you talked about your boss... Would they think that you're a follower of Jesus? If the only thing they saw was how you treated a waitress who was struggling in the middle of her busy shift, would they think that you follow Jesus? Or how about this? If the only thing they had to go off of was what you liked, commented, shared, and what you posted on social media, would they see an agape love? Would they see the love of Jesus? Would they see a transformative love, a love that is sacrificial, a love that is unconditional? Or would they just see another poser, another person talking all about Jesus' love, but always failing to show it to someone else? Y'all, this isn't how we change the world. This is how the world stays exactly the same or gets even worse. We can't afford to fail to show love. We can't afford to not share love to others. Because like I said, we're being watched. You right now, if you're a teacher, if you're the boss at your work, if you're the manager, if you're just another worker, 
You're being watched by other people, and you are setting the tone. You are setting the example. You are being the model for what the love of Jesus does in someone's life. We can't afford to fail at that. We can't afford to mess up. There is too much on the line. There are souls on the line right now that if they were to die today, they will not see heaven. They will not know salvation. They will not know what it is like to be forgiven. And there are people in your work, in your school, in your own family right now that have never experienced God's love. They've never experienced agape love. They've only known love to be conditional. They've only known people that love them as, mu- as long as they have something to give. They only know love as people who might hang around them but are unwilling to sacrifice for them. And you showing God's love to them might be the one thing that changes their life forever. Don't give up that opportunity today. It's too important. It's too precious. It is too meaningful to the mission of our life, the mission of Jesus, and the mission of our church. Do not fail at this. Do not take this for granted. If y'all would, I'd like you to bow your heads for a moment. And I'd like to end service in a different way than maybe we have before. But I have another set of scripture I want to show with you, share with you today. It is also from the Apostle John, but not in his gospel, but in a letter, a series of three letters that he writes to the church. And some of you don't know this. Some of you may have been a part of a General Baptist church your entire life, but I'm going to tell you today, this verse was some of the most transformational scripture on the theology of our movement. I would go as far to say, is if it was without this scripture, then we may not truly understand in the way that we do today God's love. And as you have your head bowed, I want you to be in prayer. And I want you at the same time while you're in prayer to listen to God. To listen, what opportunity is God putting in your life right now to share love? What are some opportunities that you failed at that you're ready for redemption for today? What are some ways that you failed that you are seeking God's forgiveness for today? And if y'all would, I would like to read the scripture today as you pray. And it's from the book of 1 John in chapter 4. And it says here, Dear friends, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be a Savior to the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and in they God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but love, but the perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because we, he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen, and he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Through our Lord and our Heavenly Father God, forgive us for when we called ourselves Christians, 
for when we called ourselves our disciples, when we called ourselves church members, when, they called, when we called ourselves Christ followers, and yet we failed to do the very thing your scripture teaches us. We failed to do your new and final command with, to us, which is to love God. May there be a shifting in our spirit today. May there be a shift in our hearts and our mind today. That God, when we step into the church, we are not stepping into a battlefield. We're not stepping into a place where we're fighting each other for influence. We're fighting each other for a place to stand. We're fighting each other for what we want. But God, may this be a place of love that anyone who comes through those doors, no matter what happened Saturday night, no matter what happened last week, no matter what happened in their past, that they can come here and find love today. That if there's a Christian who's a part of an abusive culture right now and has a messed up version of you and what your love is, may they come here and truly know what God's love is. May they see it, not just in the word, not just in the preaching, but in the community that we share here together. And Lord, if there is someone here today that has a grievance, that has a grudge against their brother and sister in Christ, then God, may there be a spirit of forgiveness that lays over this place today. For God, if we fail to love each other, then your scripture says we are failing to know you. Lord, forgive us of our sins, for they are many. And help us as the church, as your body, as your arms, as your feet, that we may never fail to reach out to those who need it and be a helping hand be a friendly smile, be a loving friend. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.